Hey, good morning. Happy uh, spring break to you. I'm sorry that you didn't get invited on a cruise or something like all of your your cool friends did. We're talking about suffering today, and I feel like this is a perfect message for us because we're having to suffer here on spring break here in Texas while all of our friends are out doing cool things. And so when I was little, the first time I remember my dad passing out, um, which we now, we later found out was actual seizure. Um, I was, I was young, young, I don't know how old I was, I was, I was about this old. And so he had gotten up in the middle of the night, and while he was up, he passed out. And so my mom heard the noise, and she gets up, and she walks in, and she sees her husband laying on the ground. And my mom and I, uh, we have a lot of similarities. And one of the things that we have similar is the way that we handle pressure situations. It's awful. Like, if you need me to take the last shot, you're going to lose. You know, I read stories about people doing brave things, running into a burning building to save people. They're not talking about me. If something were to happen here and it was up to me to rescue you, I apologize. It's probably not going to end well. So my mom and I, we handle these situations very similar. We freak out. So my mom walks in, sees her husband laying on the ground, and so she um, straddles him and starts slapping him in the face, <laughs> screaming, wake up, wake up. And I'm across the hall sleeping, and I hear this, so I get up, and when I walk in, my, my dad's laying on the ground, my mom's screaming and slapping him in the face, and so I thought I should help the situation and so I start running up and down the hallway going, Daddy's dead, Daddy's dead. And so this is the situation that my dad wakes up to is his son running up and down the hallway, his wife slapping him in the face. And my dad's like, stop slapping me. I just fell asleep. We found out later that there were seizures. We found out that my dad had a rare, it's a super rare disease called NF2, neurofibromatosis type 2. He had to go through several brain surgeries. Um, he ended up going deaf because of this surgery, uh, because of this disease. Um, and we found out a couple years later that both my brother and I also have this disease. And so when I was in high school, I had, I had a lot of questions for God. And the main question was why? Like, why was it my dad that was having to go through this. Why was it our family was having to go through this? Why do you seem so silent uh, right now? Why is it our family that is having to suffer? In a way, I know that you can ex you can relate to suffering because um, suffering isn't reserved for just people who have a rare disease or some sort of sickness. Maybe you've lost someone that's really close to you. Maybe you have a relationship in your life that's really hard. Maybe you're wondering why it is that your child got diagnosed with something or it's your child that's struggling in school or socially. We've all experienced suffering in some way within our lives. And today, when we look at our scripture, I want us to see how we can turn suffering into hope by recognizing three areas that we suffer the most. If you have your Bibles, go to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18. The scripture will be up over ahead as well. Let me give you a little bit of background. Peter is writing to Christians here. He's writing to Jews and non-Jews. Peter at one point refers to these believers as aliens. There's, they're people without a home. They're people that aren't really welcome. We know that during this time, and during the Roman Empire, that persecution had begun to ramp up against Christians. And so the Christians have been spread out through the area. And so this is who Peter is writing to. We're going to start in verse 18. It says, Household slaves. Submit with all fear to your masters, not only to the good and gentle, 
but also to the cruel. For it brings favor, if mindful of God's will, someone endures grief from suffering unjustly. For what credit is there if you sin and are punished, and you endure it? But when you do what is good and suffer, you endure it. This brings favor with God. The first place that we see suffering a lot of times in our lives is through relationships. Um, Peter here, you see the word slave. Some of your translations may say the word servant. But the key word here is when he says household. So a household servant or a household slave. We know that slavery was commonplace among the Roman Empire. But this is talking more like an employee-boss type relationship when he uses the word household. So this is someone that might be working for someone else that they had to submit themselves. And so when Peter addresses this, when you think about you and I, wherever you're working, we've all experienced bad relationships. Maybe some of those relationships are with someone that we have to submit to. Maybe it is a boss. Maybe it's a, a mom or a dad that we're experiencing a, a rough relationship with. But we all have relationships that are hard. Some of those relationships aren't necessarily ones that we have to submit to, but the same principle applies to submission to Jesus. Maybe some of those relationships that you're, you're struggling with are, are someone within your family. Maybe it's an, an in-law. I mean, for us guys, we all thought our families were perfectly normal until we got married. And then our wives were like, why does your family do this? Why do you do that? And then we're like, my family's a little bit weird. Like, family relationships can be hard sometimes. I can't tell you how many people that I've talked to, when they talk about family relationships, they've talked about having to set up boundaries. Why do we set up boundaries? Because at some point in that relationship, we've experienced some sort of hurt, right? And we've set up boundaries to protect us, to protect our family. We're all going to go through tough relationships. So maybe the bigger question is why? Why do we endure tough relationships? Why not just go find a new job, find a new group of friends? And we know that's not really possible because we'd be finding a new job maybe every week because we're going to deal with tough people we have to work with. And we can't find a new group of friends all the time. That doesn't make any sense. I want you to see what Jesus had to say about tough relationships. This is in Luke 6, 27. Jesus says, But I say to you who listen, love your enemies do what is good to those that hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If anyone hits you on the cheek, offer the other also. And if anyone takes away your coat, don't hold back your shirt either. Give to everyone who asks. And from one who takes your things, don't ask for them back. Just as you want others to do for you, do the same for them. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. If you do what is good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from who expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do what is good, and lend expecting nothing in return. Then your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. For he is gracious to the ungrateful and evil. Be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. You see here Jesus talking about lend without expecting anything back. Show grace to people who are ungraceful at times. You see... The relationships that we have with people that are easy, while we all need those relationships, those relationships as believers, as people of hope, it's not what really defines us. It's the tough relationships. 
It's the hard relationship. It's the more loving people that some people may consider to be unlovable. Jesus even goes far to say, like, when we're just friends with people that are exactly like us, what credit is that to us? Everybody does that. If we lend expecting to get it back, what credit is that? Everybody does that. See, there's an expectation in our lives when we enter into relationships that we're to love those people. If we're in relationships and we're not actively involved in loving that person, Paul describes us as a clashing symbol. He says when we do things without love, we're like a gong. I don't know if you've ever been compared to a gong but I can't imagine being compared to a gong as ever being a good thing. If you're single in here, you don't want to probably have gong in your pickup line. You don't want to tell someone, you sound a lot like a gong. It's probably not going to go very well. I'm not going to say that to my wife. If I said that to my wife, I'm probably going to duck really quick because I know a slap is coming. <laughs> but yet, this is what Paul says. When we do things like that, Without love, we're just noisy. And so I don't say very many things that are quotable, but you're going to want to write this one down. You're probably going to want to get a tattoo. <laughs> don't be a gong, okay? Don't be just noisy. Jesus tells us that people are going to mistreat us. Peter says that we're going to encounter people who are cruel. Why would they write these things? If it wasn't an expectation of our lives for us to be involved in relationships that at times we may suffer because sometimes we're doing good and we're not getting good back. But that's what defines us as believers is extending grace and being people of hope to people that aren't like us. I heard one time, I heard one time that Wounded dogs don't bark, they bite. When you look at relationships and why people act the way that they do, it's because we're all wounded and hurt in some way. And so sometimes we're reacting out of our past, out of hurt. That includes our bosses sometimes, our coworkers, our wives. We react because of our wounds and our hurts. Sometimes we react out of our insecurities. Listen to this quote by Timothy Keller. It says, look at Jesus. He was perfect, right? And yet he goes around crying all the time. He is always weeping, a man of sorrows. Do you know why? Because he is perfect. Catch this. Because when you are not all absorbed in yourself, you can feel the sadness of the world. If you and I are looking to be people of hope, you and I are looking for purpose, we have to understand that relationships aren't about me. It's not about getting good in return for me doing good. It's about Jesus and about what he wants to do in other people's lives. Look back at uh, First Peter again. Look at verse 21. Peter says this, well, you were called to this because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you should follow in his steps. He did not commit sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he was suffering, he did not threaten but entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins and his body on in the tree. Having died to sins, now listen to this, so that we might live for righteousness, you have been healed by his wounds. I don't know if you're like me, but there's sometimes when I read the Bible, uh, there's verses sometimes that stick out that I'm like, I don't like that very much. Like if I was writing the Bible, I wouldn't have put that in there because I don't really, I'm not very comfortable with that. But Peter says that here. When he says, for we are called to this. We are going to suffer. Sometimes that's going to mean that we're going to suffer physically. When I was in second grade, um, 
I had a teacher that would give us busy work in the morning. Um, and I'm, I was smarter than most second graders, okay? And I realized that she was just giving us busy work and that she wasn't grading it. Again, I was smarter than most second graders. And so she gave us busy work because she was, she was doing the attendance for the day and, and lunch roll. And so I understand that makes me really old because she would actually go individually and call your name and she would say, hot or cold lunch. And then she would say, regular or chocolate milk. And it's always chocolate milk. If you're a person and you don't choose chocolate milk, you're probably a hard relationship. I don't even know why she would have to ask that question. But she did. And so I realized she's not grading this work. And so I started just taking the papers and I started stuffing them underneath my books and my desk. You see, I was smart enough to know that she wasn't grading the papers. I, however, was smart enough to get rid of the evidence. And so every day she would get busy work. I would take the papers, stuff them underneath my books, and it started. To, the pile started to grow. And it started to grow so big that I couldn't close my desk all the way. And one day my teacher, she's like, Brett, don't you have any work to do? Nope. And she comes back, and she's like, why won't your desk close? No idea. She opens my desk, and she starts pulling out all these papers. And she said, oh, i got a huge stack. And she staples them together, and she writes a note to my parents. And then she says, the worst thing you can say to a kid, she says, I want you to have your parents sign this. And every kid knows, like, oh, no, like if my Parents had to know about something that's like a death sentence. That's going to be bad. And so, again, because I was smarter than the average second grader, I was like, I have to forge my dad's name. But I was in second grade. I didn't know how to write cursive. But I'm smart. So I found something that my dad had signed his name on, and I put it up on the window, and I put the piece of paper over it, and I just traced his name, gave it to the teacher the next day. And the teacher sits down, and I give it to her, and she's like, I'm like, that's funny. She looked at me like, and she's like, did your dad sign this? Yep. And so I got to meet the principal that day. Because the only thing that I could find that my dad had signed was a Valentine's Day card that he'd given to my mom. And so I signed it, Love Richard. And so I got in trouble that day. And I suffered for it. And I suffered physically for it that day. Now, my parents weren't abusive. They didn't, they didn't abuse me or hit me, but they did spank. They didn't spank often. But when they spanked, I had earned it. And I deserved it, and I had earned it that day. I had deserved the spanking. But when we think about suffering physically, what about the, t what about the times that we, we wonder what we've done to deserve this? A lot of times when, when we suffer physically, because it makes no sense at all, we try to make sense of it, and we start saying things, and we start asking these questions about, you know, what happened here? What did I do to deserve this? In John 9, we see a similar story where the disciples are asking a question exactly like we would. Jesus and the disciples, they come up to a man who's been been blind from birth and when they see him the disciples are just like us they're trying to make sense of suffering physically and they look at Jesus and they say who messed up did, did he son did his parents son why is it why is he like this and we have similar questions a lot of times don't we when we start to suffer physically because suffering physically a lot of times doesn't make any sense to us when I was in high school and my dad was going through multiple surgeries and he ends up deaf and he ends up having to go on disability, our church was praying, our family was praying, I was praying, but we weren't, we weren't seeing God move the way that I thought that he should move. And so I started to take some of it on my own and I was thinking, well, maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe, maybe God's not answering our prayers because I'm not praying the right way. Maybe I've got sin in my life, and we need to be careful when we suffer physically. 
a lot of times the easiest place for us to point a lot of times is we start trying to make it about ourselves. And we start trying to almost make excuses for, for God and for what's going on. Jesus, in reply to his disciples, says something that I like and I don't like. So when they say, who messed up? Jesus says, nobody, which I like that part. But then he says, this is happening so that I can be revealed. That part I don't know whether I like. Because sometimes it's hard to think about we're suffering physically. And God wants to use that to reveal himself to us in a different way. He wants to use our suffering to reveal himself to those that have even surrounded us. I found, found that when I'm suffering physically, the other thing that I have to be careful of is I make excuses for God sometimes. Like my, when there's this tension between a good God and bad things happen, when there's this tension, sometimes our mouths start to move more than they should, and we start to say things um, that that we think are helpful, but they're not very biblical. When you look at verse 22, when you look at Jesus' reaction to physical suffering, it says he committed no sin, no deceit was found in his mouth. And yet I find when I'm suffering, a lot of times it's my mouth that gets me in trouble because I'm trying to explain things away. We say phrases like, well, God wouldn't give you more than you can handle which anybody with a child understands that that's a lie. Because like, as soon as you're handed a baby, you're like, this is way more than I can handle. I have no idea what I'm doing right now. I remember it was said about my dad when he was going through this. They said, well, God, God only gives this to the people who are strong. And I remember thinking, well, if this is the reward for being strong, count me out. I'll just be weak. Tension makes our mouths move more than they should. You know anybody in your life that when they get nervous, they start getting chatty? I do that. Ask Amy anytime before any of my surgeries. I'm talking a lot. I'm cracking jokes all the time because tension makes our mouth move. I read that during police investigation, there will be someone that was not a suspect and they become a suspect because when they're asked a question, they give up more information than what was asked of them. Because nerves and tension do this to our mouths. And we need to be careful. We need to be careful that we're not making up things about, about God and about Jesus that are just not true. And so this means that we just grin and bear it, right? And that's not what the Bible has to say. It's not about grinning and bearing. Look at this verse in Hebrews 4, 15. It says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tested in every way as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews also says that we can approach the throne of grace with confidence. This should give us incredible comfort that we have a God this sympathizes with us and understands us. And so it's not about us trying to fake it. I would say that if your mouth is saying one thing and your heart is saying something else, that's deceitful. That we can go to God and we can be honest. If you look at Hebrews, just a chapter earlier, it's describing who God is and it says, everything is laid bare. Everything is wide open. There's nothing hidden from God. And when I look at that, along with this, what we just read in Hebrews, that's such incredible comfort. That there's nothing in our lives that are hidden from God. The dark places and the bright places. And God still says, you can come to me with confidence. See, worship is not us pretending that everything is just okay. We cannot experience true fulfillment in Jesus Christ if we have part of our hearts that we're trying to hide. 
Relationships are at their healthiest when they're transparent. And that's what God has asked us to do, to be transparent. Go back to 1 Peter, verse 22, 23. It says, he did not commit sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he was suffering, he did not threaten, but entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. The last place that we see suffering a lot of times is in, is in our purpose. This is the why. Why am I making the right choices? Why am I making these choices that seem to honor God? And it seems like everybody else is getting ahead besides me. I'm sure in your jobs, at some point, we've all known people that you work with that they seem like they cut corners. Maybe they were a little bit greasy, and it seems like they're getting their promotion. Everybody's getting ahead, and you're like, I'm trying to make choices that honor God, and everybody's getting ahead besides me. If you're in here, and you're in high school, or you're in college, probably no one knows about about this topic that I'm talking about right here and making God honoring choices and not being rewarded more than you, you're going to go through a long period of, uh, of time where it seems like you're trying to make choices that honor God and everyone else is being rewarded. You're looking at your friends and people that you know and it seems like they're not making those good choices and yet they're more popular. They're making better grades. They got the boyfriend or the girlfriend. They're getting more playing time than you are. And you're looking and saying, why am I making these choices that honor God? It doesn't seem like it's paying off. And I want you to know something. That part of your reward is going to be that you're not going to have regrets in the future. And you're not going to look back at your life and look at the choices that you've made and have regrets. Your reward is not yet. I know that you're not perfect and you're making all the perfect choices. But listen, the choice to honor God, you're never going to regret in your future. Luke 6.38, Jesus says this. He says, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, press down. Shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap. For the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Jesus says for us to experience purpose, we've got to give. And listen, if, if, our, if your purpose is set up on having reward here and now, then your purpose is in the wrong place. It's not about having reward here and now. Jesus says that he's going to give to us. And when he does, it's going to be squeezed and pressed, and it's going to be pouring into our lap. We can't find purpose if we haven't entrusted our lives fully to Jesus. When you look at Jesus' response to suffering, it says he entrusted himself to his father. Why? Because the father was worthy to be trusted. Romans 8.28 says, For all things work together for good with those that are called according to his purpose. It doesn't mean that all things are good all the time. But if you've entrusted your lives to Jesus, all of these things, all of these suffering, they're going to work together for good. When I, I used to always say of my dad when I was watching him walk through such hard times, I used to say he got to experience and know a side of Jesus that many of us will never get to know and see this side of heaven because of the experiences that he went through. And I believe for all of us, just like this verse says, it's suffering, it hurts, yes. But at some point, we're going to be able to step back from it and see all that God has revealed about himself in a way that 
wasn't possible without suffering. And you're going to be able to see that glimpse of Jesus' face that maybe you didn't see before. And you're going to be able to step back and say, this is good. I talked earlier about my why. I'm saying, why is this happening? Why is this happening? I, I want to kind of give you part of my why. See, 35 years ago, my dad was diagnosed with this super rare disease. I grew up in a small town in Illinois in the cornfields. Here I am 35 years later. I moved to Katy, Texas. I end up working at Kingsland, specifically at North Katy. Why? Did you know that there's a little girl here named Katy that has NF2? And to see Katie walking down the hallway, smiling, next week Katie has surgery for an NF2 related thing. Who does that? Who works all things together for good? That's crazy. I've gotten to know Katie and her family over the past year. And I'm going to guess if you ask Beth and Wes, that's Katie's parents. I bet if you ask them about me, they're going to say some nice things about I've been a blessing to them. But I want you to know that they've been the blessing. To watch them walk through this with their child, any of us as parents know it's one thing for us to suffer, but when it's our kid, like, oh, no, don't mess with my kid. But to watch Beth and Wes walk with their family, and trusting Katie, it's been an incredible blessing to me. Why? This past year, we found out that my daughter has NF2. You know what this looks like to me? It looks like it's been pushed together and squeezed and pressed, and it's all running in my lap. And I'm like, I don't even know what to do with all of this. And then I'm reminded that Jesus says, give. So I try to scoop up as much as I can of this blessing and give it to someone else. I don't know what you walked in here with today. I don't know if there's broken relationship, things in your marriage, things with your kids. I don't know if you lost someone, if you're sick. Um, but I know that we've all experienced suffering at some point. And I know that we all have wounds and we're hurting. And I want you to know that if you'll entrust your life to Jesus, you'll find a God who loves you and will walk with you. I'm not promising that everything's going to be better tomorrow and that all your problems are going to go away. But I am promising you'll find a God that will walk with you and understands you and grieves with you. And I want you to know that Kingsland is a community that will walk with you. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you love us. Not only just, uh, just a random word, love, but that you love us intimately. That you love us enough to know our pains and our hurts. You love us enough that you give purpose through that and hope. I pray that you would reveal parts of our hearts that we've been trying to hide. I pray that you would heal our hearts and our wounds. Help us to trust you fully, Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.